The Tudor History and Travel Show is a podcast that brings Tudor history to life by exploring Tudor places and artefacts in the flesh. You will be travelling through time with Sarah Morris, the Tudor Travel Guide, uncovering the stories behind some of the most amazing Tudor locations and objects in the UK. Because when you visit a Tudor building, it is only time and not space which separates you from the past. And now over to your host, Sarah Morris. Hello, my friends, and it's a very big Happy New Year from me to you, no matter where you are on four corners of planet Earth. You are most welcome to this first episode of the Tudor History and Travel Show for 2024 with me, Sarah, the Tudor Travel Guide. This is just a note to say that if you are hearing this, then you are not currently part of my membership programme and will only be hearing the first part of each show. In order to access full episodes of the Tudor History and Travel Show, you will need to become a member of my membership site, The Ultimate Guide to Exploring Tudor England, via the link in the description associated with this podcast. Well, it is January, of course, and now January, for me, is all about the founder of the Tudor dynasty, Henry Tudor, who was born at Pembroke Castle on the 28th of January, 1457. Now, if you've been following me for any length of time of late, you will know that I've developed a little bit of an obsession with Henry VII. I wrote about him and his 1486 progress for my membership, The Ultimate Guide to Exploring Tudor England. And more recently, in fact, currently, I am deep in researching and writing about the 1502 progress with his consort, Elizabeth of York at his side, Henry travelled from Woodstock in Oxfordshire to South East Wales. So my world has been full of a lot of Henry recently. And so you can imagine that last summer, during the hottest two weeks of the year, we were so, so lucky, I travelled to Pembrokeshire with Chris to explore some of the Tudor locations which are associated with Henry Tudor, the founder of the dynasty. And as I mentioned, one of the most famous and one of the most magnificent of those is Pembroke Castle. And that, my friends, is where we are heading on our time travelling today. Yes, I am teleported to the centre of Pembroke Castle to meet with our guide, Gareth Mills, who knows everything there is to know about the history of the castle. We had a wonderful day exploring all its nooks and crannies, from the tower in which Henry VII is said to have been born to the depths of Wogan's Cave, which potentially plays a very interesting part in the story of Henry and Jasper Tudor's flight to freedom. There is a lot to explore at the castle, so what I want to do is invite you to buckle up because we are going time travelling. But just before we do, remember that there is a show notes page associated with this podcast where you will find some descriptive text. You will also find some images of my visit to Pembroke Castle to help bring the narrative to life and also some useful links, including where to go to find out more about the castle and how and when to visit. So do check that out. But for now, it really is time to hit the road. So ladies and gentlemen, I give you the magnificent Pembroke Castle and the equally magnificent Gareth Mills, our guide for today. Hello, dear listeners. Welcome to Pembroke in South Wales. Yes, I have come the four hour journey from my home in Gloucestershire to come to a place that I've wanted to visit for so long now. In fact, I'm standing in the centre of Pembroke Castle and today we are going to be going on a guided tour of the castle and to hear all about its importance in relation to the genesis of the Tudor dynasty because, of course, Henry VII was born at Pembroke Castle. Now, our guide today who is going to take us on our way is Gareth Mills. Hello, Gareth. Welcome. Hello, very pleased to meet you. We have the most magnificent day here, don't we? Absolutely perfect. The sun is beating down, it's blue skies, and I'm so looking forward to hearing all about the history of the castle. Thank you for joining us today. 
Thank you very much for coming. It's a pleasure to have you come around the castle and uh, let's uh, have a little look at the tour. Absolutely. Now, can you just um, tell us perhaps who you are and what do you do here? Why yeah. do you know so much about Pembroke Castle? <laughs> well, my name's Gareth Mills. I'm a retired uh, history teacher. Um, I moved to Pembrokeshire 31 years ago, but originally uh, I, I was brought up and worked in Monmouthshire as well. So uh, castles and uh, Norman castles in particular have been very, very close to my historical background. Uh, I retired from education 10 years ago and in retirement uh, I decided to become a tour guide in Pembroke Castle to give something back. Having taken so many children around the castle, it's lovely to actually um, tell some of the adults about the history of this wonderful, wonderful castle. Well, I hear you're legendary in these parts, so if anybody wants to come to the castle, they may well bump into you, right, if they're lucky and you can be their tour guide. It's, it's very kind of you to say that, but we have a team of seven and they're all equally as good as me, I can assure you. Uh, OK, so look, I, I arrived and the first thing I saw was this incredible castle from across the river. It's so photogenic, isn't it? And unlike, so, I mean, there are so many castles in Wales. That's what I found out in the last sort of week that I've been here. There are castles around every corner. But I have to say, this is probably one of the most impressive that I've seen. It survives, at least in terms of the curtain wall and the towers, seems to me to be fairly intact. Yeah, um, the castle is the oldest castle in Pembrokeshire. It was the first castle built by the Normans, um, but sadly it was destroyed partly by Oliver Cromwell in 1648. So the main gatehouse and some of the outer walls were destroyed. So from 1648 until the start of the 20th century, anybody and everybody could come into this castle and that's why a lot of the stone has disappeared. And you'll note that a number of the farms around here have wonderfully dressed stone, oh. <laughs> which uh, I think some of the farmers might have borrowed. Uh -huh. um, but the castle was bought and started to be renovated at the start of the 20th century. And a, a number of the outside curtain walls that you see today are in fact reconstructions. Ah. But there is still a huge amount of the original castle left. And because in area, it's one of the biggest castles in the area, there's a huge amount for people to come and explore. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, the, it's impressive. I walk through the gatehouse and the first thing you see is this huge open space in front of you. And then, in fact, you brought me to start this chat today onto a map of, I guess, is it, is it all of Wales? Yes. Yeah, it's so big. I was trying to get the perspective of it there. So um, tell me, why did you want us to start our chat here? Right, well, the map was put in um, a, a good few years ago to tell the story of the importance of the Norman conquest in Wales and Pembroke Castle's part in that conquest. Um, when the Normans conquered Saxon England after mm. 1066. They arrived at the border between what was Saxon Mercia and Wales around 1070. But William the Conqueror never invaded Wales at that point. The invasion or the start of the invasion of Wales doesn't start until 1093, a good 20 years after. And that's from William the Conqueror's nephew, Roger de Montgomery. Roger de Montgomery was the great lord of the marches on the border between England and Wales. And he is the one that starts to lead the incursion into Wales. Wales was divided into seven kingdoms at that time. Mm. So the idea from Roger de Montgomery was to pick one of the kingdoms off. And in 1093, the um, kingdom of de Hoibeth, which is current day um, Pembrokeshire, Ceredigion, and Carmarthenshire, their great prince, Rhys Ap Tudor, died, leaving three sons. Mm. There were no laws of inheritance in Welsh society at that time. And the three Welsh princes couldn't decide who was going to be the next great prince of de Hoibeth. So... Being good Welsh boys, how did they settle the argument? A fight? They went to war against each other. <laughs> of course they did. So Roger de Montgomery, looking for an opportunity to invade one of the Welsh kingdoms, here's there's a civil war raging in West Wales. So in 1093, he comes with a small force, and he is the one that makes the first incursion and chooses the site of Pembroke as the castle because of its exceptional natural defences. Right. Following that... Pembroke Castle in 1103 becomes the property of Henry I, the King of England. And he is the one that lays down a challenge to the Norman barons to come to this peninsula and build castles to establish an English hub. Between 1104 and 1120, over 100 Norman barons came wow. to the peninsula of what was De Hoibeth and built castles or fortified manor houses. 
As a result, Pembrokeshire has more 12th century castles than any other place in Great Britain. Impressive. And it is called Little England... What, it, what? Little England Beyond Wales. There you and, go. and culturally, it still is Little England Beyond <laughs> Wales. Um, we are one of the furthest points from England, yet if you go into any shop... Uh, pub or restaurant here, everybody, their mother tongue is still English. Is that right? And that's as a result of that Norman invasion, if you like, in the 12th century. Um, as well as the Norman invasion, Henry I encouraged Flemish refugees to come and settle in this area. So there was a Flemish community here. And in many of the villages, you'll still see the remains of Flemish chimneys and Flemish houses. Wow. It's a real mix, a cultural mix. And, of course, Welsh people were here as well, but many of them were subjugated by the Normans. Yeah. So it's a real cultural mix which still exists today. Wow, and English is the main language. That's fantastic. Wow, I'm feeling right at home already. <laughs> anyway, um, you were talking to me about the fact that there was an early Norman castle, and I understand you've got maybe got some models that we can go and have a look at, and you can explain how the castle developed over the centuries. Yes. Um, in our main exhibition room, we have two wonderful models. One of the original castle, which was built by Roger de Montgomery, a very small wooden affair. And then we also have a ca um, the stone castle that was built by William Marshall in the 13th century, which shows all of the wonderful stone in all of its splendour when it was lived in. Fantastic. Can we go and have a look at that now? Yeah, no problem let's, at all. Let's head in that direction, lead the way. OK. So we've come into the exhibition room, which is in the gatehouse, Absolutely and right. we've got a large glass cabinet here, and I can see this is an early model of the castle. Can you talk about its defences? You said it was built here for particular reasons. Maybe you can talk about the defences and what we're seeing in front of us. Yes, um, Roger de Montgomery chose the site because of the natural defences. You're actually looking at, in the glass mirror, um, the model of the terrain on which Pembroke Castle was built. It was chosen because it is surrounded by a 100-foot cliff on three sides, which makes it easily defendable. You can only actually approach on land from one direction. Added to that around this castle is the fact that it's surrounded by tidal water. And when the Normans found this castle, when they saw the tide come in, it was 15 to 20 foot deep at the side of the three sides of the cliff. When the tide went out, we are seven miles from the open sea. So instead of a lot of water, as you can see here on the, on the picture, there was 20 meters of thick, wet, sticky mud, mm. plus a hundred foot <laughs> drop. So it was chosen for that purpose. And it was a quick build because all they had to do was put a 15-foot ditch along the landward side, bank the earth up and put a wooden palisade fence plus a gatehouse. The other two sides are surrounded by the 100-foot cliff, mm. so they didn't need much defence at all. Mm. The other incredible natural feature, however, is that Pembroke Castle is unique because it has a large natural limestone cave underneath it. And the key to the limestone cave in the future defences of the castle was that the entrance to the, the limestone cave was at high water level, not low water level. So when you had the 15 to 20 foot deep tidal water, you could sail a boat to the cave entrance. But when the tide went out, you had 15 to 20 metres of mud going down into the estuary. The Montgomery family who built the castle here never used the cave very much at all. But when the castle gets built in stone, mm. you'll see how it's transformed. And I think we're going to go down the cave, aren't we, at some point? This yes, morning? we can go down the cave. It's still there. There's a staircase that leads you there. How exciting. Because um, there's a bit of a myth and legend around Henry, but let's, let's save that story maybe okay. until we get to the cave. So this is the early structure. Um, then, what happens then? Well... The, um, the, the castle, as I said, became um, owned by Henry I. Mm. And when he died, Stephen of Blois became king. And Henry's daughter, Matilda, rebelled against Stephen of Blois. Stephen, in order to get an army, 
gave Pembroke Castle to Gilbert de Clare, the first Earl of Pembroke, in exchange for an army. And when Gilbert de Clare died, the second Earl of Pembroke becomes Richard Strongbow de Clare. Richard Strongbow de Clare becomes quite an infamous figure in the reign of Henry II. He used Pembroke Castle as a staging post to conquer half of Southern Ireland. Henry II was so concerned about Richard Strongbow de Clare in Pembroke Castle that at one stage, Henry sent an army to Ireland to stop him taking Irish lands. When Henry II died, however, he, before he died, wanted to reward what we now know as the greatest knight in Christendom, a man called William Marshall. Marshall had served in Henry II's army for over 10 years. He was a great loyal servant. He was a fantastic soldier. He'd been given the title across Europe, the greatest knight in Christendom. And in reward for the service, Henry II wants to give him titles, lands, and estates. And as he's looking for that, Richard Strongbow de Clare dies without a male heir. Very convenient. He only has a 16-year-old daughter called Isabel de Clare. William Marshall was now 40 years of age. He wasn't married. And Isabel de Clare, under the laws of inheritance, is sitting on a vast fortune that the King Henry II wants to control. The obvious answer is for William Marshall to take on the Earldom of Pembroke and all of the de Clare inheritance by marrying Isabel de Clare at 16. So, at 40, William Marshall becomes the Earl of Pembroke by marrying the 16-year-old Isabel de Clare. And he becomes Henry II's main advisor, his chief advisor. And when Henry II dies, his son Richard the Lionheart becomes king, and Marshall is one of the most important people in the reign of Richard I. Richard was out of the country nine years of ten years of his reign. The first four years he was at the Third Crusade in the Holy Land. William Marshall ruled the country on his behalf, almost as King of England, for those four years. When Richard I dies sadly in 1199, his brother John becomes king. William Marshall is the one who persuades many of the barons who didn't want John, because he was a bit of a rogue, mm -hmm. to become king. William Marshall's 50. And now Marshall, at the grand old age of 50, becomes King John's personal advisor. But they fall out after three years. And Marshall goes into exile and retirement around 1203, looking for a project. Well, he comes to Pembroke, where he's the Earl, and he sees the little wooden castle we've just talked about. Now, at the age of 53, he's still active, he's very, very keen, and he wants to turn Pembroke Castle into a magnificent stone castle to show off. So the model we're looking at now is the castle that William Marshall builds from 1203 over the next 10 to 11 years. And basically, the earlier wooden castle which is that small triangle piece on the edge of the cliff, is replaced with the stone buildings you see there. Mm. The most prominent of which is this huge great keep. But the main changes are to the outer bailey where we started, where the map was. William Marshall had his own army of 300 knights, and there was never enough space for 300 mm. knights to live in safety in the castle originally. So it's William Marshall that lays the footprint down of this castle. Where we are stood now in the gatehouse is that little wooden gatehouse there. Yeah. And because he went beyond the cliff, the new outer gate became quite uh, vulnerable. So William Marshall had a 15 foot dry ditch dug right away around the front of this castle for protection. It's now where the road is goes, that goes past the castle. Yes. That's why the road is so deep relative to the castle and the houses. But this is the castle that then becomes later developed in stone by William de Valence, who becomes the Earl of Pembroke 32 years after Marshall dies. So this becomes an incredibly important stone castle from the 13th century. Is it a second iteration then of the Earl of Pembroke? Is, is he Obviously the first Earl of Pembroke dies. It's a completely different family that inherits. Right. The, the, 
the interesting thing about the Marshall family, um, William Marshall was, was married loyally for 30 years and had 10 children when he died in 1219. But none of his 10 children had the longevity of life that he did. And by 1232, they were all dead. Wow. And William de Valence acquires the earldom of Pembroke by marrying Marshall's granddaughter, the only one left with a Marshall name. And of course, she couldn't take on the titles. And William de Valence was a half-brother of Henry III, the King of England. I see, I see. Wow. So I should just say for people who are listening that as ever will be a show notes page associated with our chat today. So we're going to be taking lots of pictures. So if you want to see some of the things that we're talking about, then do make sure that you check out the link, which is included in the description with this podcast. Okay, so... This is the genesis of the castle. We're up to what kind of time now? 1200s, 1300s? Yeah, well, we're up to, yes, the 13th century. 13th century. Uh, and then, really, the castle is in the hands of numerous earls until, of course, the Tudors come along. Yes. And Jasper Tudor becomes the Earl of Pembroke. That's where we need to go next, isn't it? Absolutely. So, shall we talk about that here, or is there another part of the castle where it'd be really good to pick up that story? I think if we go back outside, we can, we can talk about the tower where we almost 100% sure he was born in. Okay. And we do the story from there. Well, I think we should. Let's go then. listeners we've come outside again into the sun and to a tower which is very clearly labeled the Henry the Seventh Tower so this is where we can pick up our Tudor story so this is what I wanted to ask you is is how does Margaret Beaufort end up here giving birth to the little Henry Tudor well the story is a very very sad one but it's also one of the most interesting stories in Tudor history because technically she should never have given birth to Henry Tudor in this castle. The story goes quite simply that it's the story of two brothers, Edmund and Jasper Tudor. Edmund and Jasper Tudor were half-brothers of King Henry VI, the Lancastrian king. Half-brothers because they had the same mother, who was a French princess, Catherine de Valois. And the story goes that Catherine de Valois marries Henry V, They have a baby son, Henry, who becomes Henry VI, but sadly, Henry V died young. Catherine de Valois becomes a pawn in the game in England. Her son is an infant king. Because she was French, the barons wouldn't allow her to rule. So she is put in almost in exile in order to live her life close to her son, but without any politics. Where the head of a household happens to be a man called Owen Tudor. (laughs) And Owen Tudor is there to look after after Catherine de Valois, but also to keep an eye on it and make sure that she doesn't get involved in politics, etc. Well, she was only 21 and he was 23 at the time. Ah, right. Um, And what starts as a professional relationship (laughs) turns into somewhat of a friendship. (laughs) The story goes, probably in the depths of depression and homesickness, Catherine needs a shoulder to cry on. And Owen is the one to provide the shoulder. Um, And seemingly, uh, they get closer than just (laughs) friends. Mm -hmm. Because eventually, Catherine falls pregnant. And in order to legitimise the birth of the child, they get married in secret. They actually don't tell the son, the king, Henry VI, that they got married. And then 18 months later, they have a second child called Jasper Tudor. And eventually, they have to tell the king, Henry VI, that her and Owen have had two children and married secretly. How did he take that? This is the interesting question, because, as you, as you surmise, it could have gone either way. It could have. <laughs> but fortunately for Catherine and Owen and the two children, Henry loved his mother. So he actually accepts Owen as the father of the two boys 
and as the wife of his own mother. The boys are then brought to the palace. They're given titles, estates, lands, and they grow up alongside their, their half-brother, Henry VI. By the time they reach adulthood, they are very important people in the Lancastrian dynasty. They're advising their half-brother as king. But of course, we're in the middle of the Wars of the Roses. Mm -hmm. And any family who had a link to royalty in, in those days aspired that one day their family might become a monarch, a king or a queen. Now, on the surface of it, Edmund and Jasper looked important and powerful. But did they have an appropriate claim to the throne of England? Well, the answer is no, because they were the product of a French princess hated by the English and a commoner from North Wales equally hated by the English. They had no English royal blood in their veins and that is the most important criteria for a claim to the throne of England. So although on the surface they looked important, actually they knew they would have to do something if they were ever going to aspire to being monarchs. And may I ask, were they legit were, had they been legitimised by this They point? were legitimised, so therefore it, it was perfectly obvious that they could advance. Now what happens basically is when Edmund gets to around 20 years of age, he decides to do something about it. He decides to go out and find a wife who has got English royal blood in her veins so he can marry her and every child that is born through that marriage provides the missing English royal blood. Now, we're not sure to this day why he chose who he did because there were a few complications. But he ends up choosing a 12-year-old girl called Margaret Beaufort. Margaret Beaufort was already betrothed to William de la Pole at the age of four and a half. Why? Well, Margaret's mother um, was not well. Her, hus her father had died. And in order for the Beauforts to be able to claim the estates that they lived in, mm. they had to betroth the four and a half year old Margaret to William de la Pole who administered the estates. So when Edmund Tudor wants to marry this 12 year old girl, that is the first problem. It's got to be annulled. The second problem is that the English royal blood wasn't as pure as one might have thought because her claim was through her grandmother who had an affair with the Black Prince and produced a son out of wedlock. The boy was legitimized later in life. So there was still a challenge. Mm. Anyway, he overcomes the problems and he marries her at 12. And at 14, she's pregnant with her first child. Now, at that time, Edmund and Jasper were fighting the Wars of the Roses in Wales on behalf of their brother, Henry VI. And the story goes that Edmund is at Carmarthen Castle, 30 miles from here, fighting the Herbert family, the Yorkists. He gets captured by the Herberts who throw him into the dungeon in Carmarthen Castle, where he dies. The Herbert family turned around to the Tudors and said he died of the bubonic plague. The Tudors never believed it. They thought that he'd been murdered. Anyway, Edmund, the father of this child-to-be, is now dead. What about poor old Margaret? Well, Margaret is 14 and a half, six months pregnant, and under the laws of inheritance, she can't access any of her husband's estates or titles or whatever. She, technically, she's destitute. Fortunately for Margaret, Edmund had a brother, Jasper Tudor, who was the Earl of Pembroke, and this was his home. And he is the one who realised how important the birth of this child was going to be for the Tudor dynasty, not just for Margaret. So naturally, it's Jasper Tudor who says to the 14 and a half year old, six months pregnant, Margaret, come to the castle, have the baby in safety. She comes to Pembroke Castle and three months later gives birth in the tower, we're almost certain, that is behind us here. Mm. The birth was so traumatic that both of them nearly died at birth. She never had another child, even mm. though she married another twice. Mm. <laughs> The irony of the story, however, is that if Edmund the father had lived just three months longer, Edmund Tudor was the Earl of Richmond and Henry Tudor would have been born in Richmond and we wouldn't have 90,000 visitors a year. <laughs> so, yeah, it depends which way you look at it, eh? <laughs> There's 
just so many things in what you said there, Gareth. I'm, I, I hadn't really thought, really, why choose Margaret Beaufort? There must have been other more suitable brides on the market at the time. I, d I guess we don't really know the answer to that, do we? You're absolutely right, sir. We don't know the answer to it. How uh, frustrating. And as you say, when you, when you, when you research the facts around, the, around that marriage, you, he must have been able to have chosen other people. But as, as many people will know, Margaret Beaufort turns out to be an incredibly important and mm. a fantastic choice <laughs> for the mother of Henry Tudor, as I'm sure another story will tell you. Oh, I'm sure we're going to definitely get to that. But I think we can go up into the tower, can't we, and have a look yes, at this? by all means. Let, let's do that. Lead, lead the way, Gareth. You have been listening to the first part of this month's episode of the Tudor History and Travel Show. The remainder of this episode is only available to members of my membership site, The Ultimate Guide to Exploring Tudor England. To join the waitlist to become a member of The Ultimate Guide, click on the link in the description associated with this podcast. You will be added to the waiting list and I will email you just as soon as the doors to the membership next reopen. I'll see you there. Thank you for tuning in to today's episode of the Tudor History and Travel Show. If you've loved the show, please take a moment to subscribe, like and rate this podcast so that we can spread the Tudor love. Until next time, my friends, all that remains for me to say is happy time travelling. <laughs>